Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. This episode features a recorded conversation between myself, Joe Stewart and Anu. Anu is a non-binary person whose pronouns are they or them. Anu teaches a queer and trans-inclusive yoga class at Dance of Life in Fitzroy, as well as yoga in a retirement village. They are considering further training in yoga therapy and trauma-sensitive yoga. For further information on queer and trans identity, we will leave some links in the show notes. Now, I believe that yoga is a gift to the world and that everybody who wants to should have access to yoga and feel welcomed and comfortable in every class. There are some simple steps yoga teachers can take that will aid in this, so I feel the information and perspective that Anu gives in this episode is really important. Joe and I feel privileged that we get to learn from some incredible teachers while making this podcast, and we both learn so much from Anu. We're really excited to share this episode with you. Thanks for joining us, Anu. Perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. So I'm from the UK originally. I grew up in Leeds, which mm-hmm. is quite a smallish city um, in the north of England. I think at first, I used to think it was a big city until I used to live and moved to Taipei and Melbourne. So when I was growing up, I think it was only 400,000 people, but it's the third biggest city in the UK but to me it's still quite small. Is um, it quite industrial there? Y- yeah a bit yeah and I haven't lived there for 13 years but yeah I grew up there went to school there went to uni in Liverpool. What did you study at uni? Um, I studied English Lit and Cultural History. Yeah I wasn't really sure what I wanted to study so the way I chose was I ran my finger down the list of all the art subjects and at the time it was called Literature, life, and thought. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, and that's what I thought. I thought, oh wow, life and thought. That sounds great. Like that's reading. what I want to learn about. <laughs> yeah. And then when I got there, they changed the title because it sounded a bit airy fairy, like literature, life, and thought. Like, Which is what, what was appealing about. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the same content, and it and it was and it was really good. I was pretty lucky and back then. I was the, like, la- they started introducing fees, like it was all free education, um, and then they started introducing fees, but. If your parents were divorced, you still got it for free, so I was quite lucky, got in there. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Taipei, that sounds interesting. Taipei, um, yeah, I lived there, I moved there for six years. I went for a year, I'm doing speech marks. <laughs> I went for a year and ended up staying for six. And so was um, that teaching English? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And it was really interesting. It was good to be in a culturally diverse, culturally diverse place um, and having those challenges but it also was quite an easy and convenient place to live in some ways. And did um, you choose it just based on here's an opportunity, I'll go here? Kind of, yeah, I had a friend of a friend there. Yeah, that's always helpful. Yeah, <laughs> so they recommended going over and the idea was to go over, get some experience and move back to Europe with the teaching experience but yeah, just stayed. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like teaching was an early on kind of vocation. Yeah, so I did, I did enjoy teaching and then after six years I, I was ready to not teach English anymore but it was good to start teaching yoga because I still got to teach but something different and, when and you, I like teaching. And when did you discover yoga as a practice? Actually in, well I knew, I always knew about it so at uni in Liverpool I knew I was aware that yoga was there, and I always wanted to do it, but never did. I was too busy, like, partying and... Yeah, doing having, any life stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no time for me. And then... So it was always in my mind, and then I eventually did it for the first time in, in Taichung, which is in the middle of Taiwan. And it was a class... It was in all in Chinese, so I didn't really get that much. Like, I would spoke a bit of Chinese, but it wasn't enough. It's actually a really good way to learn a language, though, going to a yoga class in another language. So I went for a couple, but yeah, I didn't stick that out. But then when I moved back to Taipei, there was some yoga in English. And so I went twice a week, and it was amazing. And actually, the teacher there used to often say that 70% of yoga is listening. Ah. That's probably why I didn't really get that much from the ones in Chinese. And it was amazing because 
Taiwan, Taipei is so busy and stressful, and the job was stressful. I was super busy, lots of pollution and noise and like tiny apartments. Yeah. yeah, and um, so it was really good just to have these two hours. It was in someone's apartment, and it seemed quite classical, quite good yoga. Looking back, like we'd do chanting and had lots of aspects to it, and it was like a savior for that two days a month, a week. Yeah. It's such a great way to really ground mm. yourself in a new city as well to find your yeah. yoga class. Yeah. So you tend up like you end up connecting with nice people and it just gives you this structure in your week that's like yeah. this new time. Yeah, yeah, and the structure was really good as well and having it going regularly was really important. And then left um, Taipei and came to Melbourne and yeah, really struggled here, like finding my feet, um, was not going through a good time, like lots of personal things going on and feeling very anxious, depressed, like lonely, sad, like New city, going you don't through have your a really support network. Yeah, exactly, like yeah. not many friends at all. And I discovered I did I did end up seeing a, a psychologist but it, it wasn't good. But I, so I ended up finding I just joined a gym and at first I thought that oh maybe the yoga won't be that good but I'll give it a go and I ended up going like five times a week to yoga and that's a really oh, affordable yeah. way to do a lot of yoga yeah, classes yeah exactly yeah so I really got stuck into it and definitely not saying you should only do yoga and not see psychologists or counselors <laughs> they fulfill different needs yeah, yeah they can if you can find a good one then they're very good in conjunction so yeah it just really helped me with mm-hmm. those feelings of being human I guess all the anxiety and um, depression that you can go through at times and stress and just finding myself and being super lonely, but and yoga, it's quite an, it is an individual thing, but it did help me to and not you're still feel so part of that connected group energy, even if yeah. you don't speak to anyone yeah, on the exactly. way in and out. Yeah, uh, so. with your gym classes, mm. I'd imagine they'd be a little bit more on the physical end of the spectrum, which yeah. is probably quite helpful with depression and stuff. As it was, on. it was that, and it was so it's really good to bring me back to my body. I think I was mm. in my head a lot. I was up here. And I've always felt like I'd like connecting with my body and doing physical things. So when I lost that, the yoga really brought me back to my body. Um, but yeah, it was very physical. There was there was a little bit of breathing work. Um, and that was probably about as deep as it got. So after a couple of years, I was like, I need, I need more. Like, like I'm, I'm really liking more. this. I'm ready for more. And, and actually, that's when I found Dance of Life. Oh, great. Mm-hmm. And... Um, just by a Google search and it was like convenient <laughs> location and I went there, Johannes's first class and yeah, he was really good. It was really, yeah, he was great. I used to go, I still go to his classes, but I started going on a, finding that routine again and going very regularly um, to the teachers there. And that's a beautiful yeah. studio that really does encompass all aspects of the yeah. yoga practice because they do yeah. quite a strong physical practice. But yeah, but, yeah, yeah, they do. Other than Johannes and your teacher in Taipei, are there any other really key inspirational teachers that you've learnt from? Yeah, I'm not I learnt... in a lot of yoga either. <laughs> True. And when I was at, at school, I didn't really have many inspirational teachers, and that was really disappointing. And I think that and other reasons, I never really enjoyed school or felt inspired. Um, there was a couple of OK teachers when I went to college. Again, no one that really blew my mind or I felt like was a... A support or someone that I really connected with and then going to uni it was starting to get a bit better but I think it wasn't until I did the yoga course that I found teachers that were really inspiring and helped me to to learn in a way that I needed to learn so yeah some of the teachers at Dance of Life like Nina and also Eugenie did quite a lot of classes with them and then the teachers on my course and where was your um, course is uh, Australian yoga learning not oh, to yes. be confused with the Australia Australian Academy yeah, yoga. yeah. yeah, not yeah that there's one. Australian Yoga Academy and then yeah. the Australian Institute of Yoga learning and yes. I think that's who I also did my course with but it had a different name then because yeah. I did my course about um, 12 years ago was it at CAE yes yeah when yes. you actually when one of the when you mentioned about what you were taught and how you were taught I was like, that sounds very similar to my class yeah yeah so mine was a two mine was the last year of the two-year diploma yeah so mine was two years as well yeah, yeah. and it, then they'd stopped doing that so it's a really in-depth 
course. I felt like I needed the full two years to integrate all of that information yeah. and even got to the other end of it and felt like there's still so oh, yeah. much to learn yeah. and to know. Just a little seed that was growing. I felt like I just learned more about what I didn't know then. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. You kind of yeah. learn yeah. the directions that you want to go into. Yeah. And there were some amazing teachers on that course. And that's a really yeah. diverse course, like lots yeah. of different styles and lots yeah. of different teachers. And I'm not sure if um, Josie and Kay were still there. Yeah, they were. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's like a naturopath and a nurse and a massage oh, wow. therapist teaching the physiology and anatomy subjects. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Josie was a yeah, really big on physiology and anatomy and Kay. What actually did make you decide to start teaching? What was the, the push there? So it was after sort of stood um, practicing yoga kind of five times a week and then finding a different studio and just really getting into it and recognising how much it helped me and thinking that I wanted to continue teaching in some way and also doing so I was stuck in this stuck in a cycle of if I wasn't teaching I'd be getting office jobs and stuck in this cycle of getting these office admin jobs which weren't quite aligned. I was just doing it because I needed money, I needed a visa to stay here. I wasn't quite aligned with what I wanted to do for work. So I was in one of these office jobs and thought, oh, I could study to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I told a colleague slash friend of mine and he was like, yeah, that's the best idea ever. Why didn't you think of that earlier? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So then I... And I'm super grateful I ended up leaving that job and getting another office job, which was better. And it was amazing because it's only part time and really great team, really great boss, great place to work. And it's so a day job that you feel really good about. Yeah. It gives you space. Yeah. But still gives me that safety of a incoming regular wage. And I was able to work there part time and study two years, the two year diploma. So I felt very grateful and lucky and privileged to be in that position. Yeah, nice time. Yeah, Yeah, it was a really good time. So things might have changed quite a lot probably in the time since I did the course and you did the course. And Mm. one of the things that changed is while I was doing the course, there was always a focus on using invitational language and making everyone feel comfortable, but I hadn't heard of trauma-informed teaching or inclusive teaching styles. Mm. Um, is that something that you encountered at the Academy of Yoga Learning course or something that you've done other training in or other kind of reading about? Like, how did those mm. two streams come together for together. you? Yeah, the course was definitely about being inclusive for everyone in there. And, like, I think a lot of gym classes, for example, can just be, like, they offer one pose for everyone, there's no other option, which is problematic. So it's definitely about being inclusive in that way, like, you can offer... And the way I do it, I offer like a less challenging option first and like everyone just do this so you can work out if you want to go higher and then if you want to go more challenging do so so always yeah that invitational language and putting the responsibility back on them like i'm gonna give you three options it's your choice yeah feel into the first one feel if you want to take a little stronger or in another direction and some days people might want to do that and some days even if they could do it a week ago it doesn't mean they can do it or want to do it today so what was the next part i guess it was more oh, yeah. about the gender inclusive mm. trans teaching that's a bit of a focus of your work yeah now. Oh. so that was definitely not taught on the course but because it's my own lived experience as a queer non-binary person it was more natural to go down that way as well like you saw a void of yeah i saw a void and i saw a website which we'll talk about later probably um which gave me some ideas. I knew it was happening in the States, queer and trans yoga. I knew it was happening in Sydney. Had happened in Melbourne before, but it didn't go for very long. So I just, like, I did do a bit of research on what they were doing, but I didn't have any specific training. Well, you have your life. Exactly. It's my lived experience. (laughs) That was the training, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you also have a teaching style that is very open for people to do what's right for them mm. rather than a prescriptive style so yeah. I think if you're already working with that kind of approach you don't necessarily have to have a lot of preconceived and trained ideas like there's just that space to yeah. explore yeah yeah for sure and a lot of the classes the yoga would be the same as if I'd like a teach in a gym as well and it it might be exactly the same some days there's nothing what makes it queer and trans is me is the people that come and is the physical space that I set up like making the toilets gender neutral 
uh, the forms that I ask people to fill in um, can be quite sp specific about pronoun, but also stuff on if they've had any type of surgery, and it could be any type of surgery, just to make sure that they're, the surgeons allow them to come back. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. You have a really lovely, it's not a legal disclaimer at the end of your form, but it's just a statement about honouring your own body and your own yeah. experience and getting help when you need it and kind of taking responsibility for your own practice yeah. and safety, which I thought was expressed really beautifully. Mm. Binary male, female gender box on an online form is something that I could imagine for a lot of people would just be a really jarring and negative experience because it's already trying to, yeah. you know, yeah. classify people. Is there any other kind of languaging that you see on, you know, yoga school websites or forms or basically I'm thinking... For teachers who haven't had this personal lived experience, is there things we could be doing better with language to make our classes mm. more inclusive? Um, so yeah, not not putting people into boxes because I guess that's mm. what we're always asked to be. We're always asked to put ourselves into a box, or people are trying to put us into boxes. So not doing that um, with gendered language. Asking yourself, is it really necessary? Like, do I really need to know anyway? what someone's genitalia is. It's yeah, kind of absolutely. what they're asking. Yeah, is that form just... Is that a question on your form because it's yeah. on every other form you've exactly. seen or do you actually like, need to know that? Yeah. Like, think outside the box. Sometimes people ask for so much information on forms, like they want so much data and what are they doing with it? Why do they need it? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's because people um, have seen it on other forms yeah. so they're like, oh, that's important. Yeah. So that's what goes on yeah, the form. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because I have today's date on my new client form and everyone's like, what's the date today? And yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like, I don't even know why I've got that question on yeah. my form. Like, it's not yeah. actually that important for my records yeah. later. Yeah, right. So you're taking it off. I'm going to redo my whole form. Yeah. Other <laughs> things that I want to change yeah. as well. Yes, making those forms is challenging in itself. Like, what do I really need to know? One yeah. question that I do have on my form now, yeah. which I got... I can't remember where I saw it, but I've got a very small studio, so it works. I ask people if they want to have a fun, playful session, a thoughtful, meditative session, or more of a physical-type workout mm. session, or all of the above. And that's been super helpful for me. If yeah. it's someone who I haven't seen before, and you can put all of those things in the one class, and it would be a yeah. balanced class anyway, but it's like, oh, that's information I appreciate up front. Yeah. And yes, that's good information. That's what you need. Yeah. <laughs> um, but other language on websites and forms is mainly about gendering, putting people in boxes. And in the studio itself, if you... One of the things I encountered a lot, which was troubling, is if you are read as female and then... And everyone else is also read as female, then if the teacher is referring to everyone as ladies... Like, ladies, ladies, ladies. That's a big, yeah. big no-no mm -hmm. for me um, and for a lot of people. And regardless of how they identify, even if they identify as female, they don't necessarily want to be referred to as a lady. Absolutely. I know plenty of people who hate being called lady. Well, it's not even on the, the same sort of spectrum. I actually find it a little bit odd when the rest of the class is, is sort of referred to as is female and me being sort of one of the only males in the class. Yeah, so like women yeah. yeah. and run. Yeah, yeah. yeah painful for me but um you're like oh now i'm singled out yeah, yeah. 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 Look at me. Look at me. Wow. it's just yeah it's just not necessary you could just mm. everyone people folks people say guys guys is fine mm -hmm. some people don't like guys but i'm kind of trying myself from guys to folks folks is nice, folks is yeah. nice. Folks folks is everyone folks is making a comeback because i remember back in the day i thought folks was like maybe a bit geeky or like what is <laughs> folks but no i'm, I'm using folks mm -hmm. more now or are you and then just saying everyone? Yeah, exactly. Right. Everyone. Women or... yeah. yeah. And I guess like making statements like, oh, you know, all men are not flexible and then and women are flexible. Things mm -hmm. like that. Well some some people are, some people aren't, and I don't think gender matters. Like Yeah, that's mm -hmm. an unnecessary yeah. like add on. Mm -hmm. But you often hear about oh women who have the more flexible hips. Yeah. So I have not had more flexible hips. Exactly. There's definitely like biological things going on, and but there's just no need to make the the stereotypes or the placing these ideas on everybody. And it would just straight away pull you out of your present experience mm. in the practice and yeah. just bring you up into in the head. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of I experienced that too. A lot of like, say, if you're going to chaturanga, bending your elbows close and letting yourself 
doing like a, the press up. Can't describe chaturanga in. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's clear. and then they might often say like, "Women put your knees down. The strong men they can." Uh. Like, oh, you know, things like that, like, not all men, in doing my quote marks again, <laughs> not all men are going to want to have that strength, mm. and not all women don't, so just... Yeah, you could be hurting someone else's shoulder and someone yeah. else's feelings with yeah. that comment. Yeah, so... And like it's that, also yeah. taking that decision-making process away from the individual person, mm. whereas you might say, if you're feeling good with this, you could leave your knees up, or if you feel like it's putting pressure on your shoulders, you could bring your knees down, yeah. making it a functional cue. Yeah taking it into a like well i'm making the call on this one yeah yeah as a teacher <laughs> yeah exactly and so my teacher training was a while ago but i definitely don't remember there being any classes on an inclusive class for a queer and trans student is there anything that you'd like to share with new or old yoga teachers and is there anything you'd like to see added to teacher training um yeah so Added to teacher training could at least just be an, an hour or two hours on diversity and all sorts of diversity, so gender and trans, but also race, right. different bodies, people in bigger bodies. So yoga isn't just for skinny white people. So for me personally, yeah, it, the course, it was very inclusive in some ways. Um, and so that met, gave me... And after about a year of being on the course, I wrote an email, a sort of a coming out email to everyone thinking that um, there are a bunch of yogis, they'll all be totally mindful and able, totally down with all of this and it won't really be a problem. So I came out and, you know, asked for non-gendered language and they pronouns and the pronoun thing was the biggest thing, it always is. Like, people just just doesn't make sense they just don't get it and so that was often people will just not use the pronoun they'll avoid it they'll they might just avoid using a pronoun altogether instead of actually just practicing it so I tried I just put myself out there and tried to create this safe space for them to to practice and to be able to do it and it was successful in some, some ways and not others um and there was one particular teacher, a couple of them actually, who were very much like referring to us all as ladies. I was able to stop that. One of them was really conscientious about it and at the end of the class kind of asked me if he'd messed up or anything. Um, so I was really worried and really tried hard. But I did have to send that email and, and educate them. And I remember in my very last class, which was like for the assessment, and one of the teachers... One of their mates, I got some great feedback, and one of the feedback was, I knew you are the real deal. And one of them who had, because there was someone who did the class, and then one of them was doing the assessment, and the one who did the class did misgender me at the end and referred to me as she, which I'd actually just been use, used to. Like, even though I'd asked to be referred to as they, I was still getting she'd. Uh, and I just thought, I was like, well, okay. Um, there's only so much I can keep asking them to not. And, and anyway, then she apologised to me. On the, on the last day and apologised as they were giving my assessment. It took a while and I think part of it was she'd finally, she'd found this new respect for me or something and I don't know, she just felt the need to apologise at that time for using she, which was good. And then recently I've sent another email to people coming out so I'm sort of educating people as I go along and doing different groups of people <laughs> <laughs> and finding that I need to send create safe spaces for myself as well as for other people so I sent this email to a lot of the yoga teachers that I go to and got some really great feedback and you know one in particular was really amazing and said that you are it's good to be reclaiming our identity and living from the outside from the inside out rather than the outside in which is a lot of what we can often do and in terms of yeah adding to yoga teacher training just even just an hour of diversity training so much time is spent on not making someone feel bad because they have tight hamstrings or you know yeah. they're not as strong in their core and using really careful language around that not to make yeah. someone feel less than and like this is huge like this is someone's whole identity and like yeah. you're saying it's not just queer and trans identity it's race it's age yeah. it's ability there's so many mm. other 
aspects to who someone is. Yeah. And often it is just having that moment of mindfulness when you're yeah. speaking just to like check what you're saying and see if you can actually use more clear words yeah. that aren't going to exclude anyone and get yeah. your message across. Yeah. And I think people sometimes can overthink things and worry so much that mm. they're going to include and worry that they have to be overly political, cor- politically correct, that they just, they might not bother trying, but it's really, it's just quite simple. For me, it's quite simple. And from a, and I think as well, I thought from a yogic perspective, you think about the, the koshas and the, the five bodies, we're not just one body. So if you think we've got the physical body, the breath and energy, we've got the mind, the monkey mind and the the more the, um, the wisdom mind the wisdom mind the the witness and then you've got the bliss and the true self and the soul so that's like five different at least five different bodies per person so that is a pronoun to me kind of makes sense yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at it that way and and also it's just when you explain it to people in a kind way and say I'm not asking you to understand but respect and uh, and it's not that hard and they're like oh yeah you're right it's actually not that hard and it's just kind of developing a new neural pathway yeah um and thinking a little bit outside of the box which yoga is good to do as well I think as well sometimes not just saying the words you were trained with but really thinking about what you actually want to say yeah I think as well, um, sending someone an email is such a great way to get your message across because you have all the time that you need to organise your thoughts as you write it. Yeah. And they have all the time that they need to digest that and integrate it. And, you know, everyone's got their own space to take that information on board. And that email I wrote was almost a year in the making like I wasn't writing it every day but I was thinking about it and then turning it over in your mind yeah and adding and changing and who am I going to send it to and then in the end I was like I'm just going to send it to everyone because and then having coming to the realization that yeah I might be in a class and am I going to if I'm going to be used as like an example to demonstrate in my mind it's what, what pronoun are they going to use And how is everyone else going to view me? And I don't understand. I see myself as this person. How can other people not see me as a they? How do people think that? That's what's going on for a lot for myself. I can't speak for all. There's lots of different trans identities, so I only speak for myself. But and that's another thing. Like I'm not an expert on trans or gender diversity. You're an expert on you. I'm an expert on me Mm. and my story and I just know that there are many other trans identities out there and um I'm not going to fully understand them but I'll definitely respect them and I think when people fill out my forms as well they can specifically talk about trans issues like being on tea and whether that's affecting that's testosterone and whether that's affecting their flexibility at that time when depending on when they've had it or if the injections you can have tea various ways and one is an injection and maybe that's sore in that area so they might just mention that so that's affecting what poses they can do um and depending on what surgery they've had that can affect how they can move and what they're wearing if they're wearing a binder which is a chest binder um so all these things that people feel comfortable to bring up but even if the yoga isn't specifically trans and gender diverse people might bring these issues up and if you haven't heard of them before instead of running away you can just google google is an amazing friend (laughs) an amazing resource and and for all medical issues exactly like you don't have to pretend you know what you're talking about you can go away and research it and come back like if someone puts a medical issue in there that doesn't have anything to do with trans or gender diverse identities i i can i'll look at them i'm not i mean i'm not an expert on medical issues a lot of I think as a yoga teacher as well, we get lots of information about medical stuff and sometimes I'm, like, I'm not a doctor. I don't know, but I can Google and try and work around what you've described. And sometimes mm. as well, people um, are actually quite happy to talk about what's going on for them. So mm. if they've had a recent surgery or something and you 
may not know the details about which muscles were severed or reattached or anything, you can still just ask them, like, okay, are there any movements that feel mm-hmm. like a problem for you now? Are there yeah. any things you don't feel comfortable doing? Do you yeah. think you'd be okay to adapt in class or just to call me over if you need some help? Like, you can still... Um, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the body to keep someone safe in your class. Yeah. And it, like, not... And just being... It could be any surgery and just being not being visibly shocked by what they've had done to their body and just looking at it from a medical perspective, like, can you do this? So you've had this, whatever it was, what can you do, what can you not do, you know, working around that. And um, I had this experience when Ryan was going through some medical treatment to not bring a whole lot of your own emotional baggage to that person because, you know, if they're going through... A surgery or a treatment yoga is their time to relax mm. and to breathe they don't necessarily want to unpack they don't want to have to comfort you if you're in an emotional state about their issue like yeah. i think as a teacher you part of being compassionate to your students is not freaking out at them mm. when they bring something like that to you it's just kind of giving them their space and giving them enough guidance that they feel safe and sometimes that is saying okay, I don't think this actually would be a suitable class for you today. You know, let's come back when you've got your doctors okay or when you're feeling confident to do this amount of movement. Another thing that I've just experienced as a teacher, this is coming back to how valuable it is to have a queer and and trans inclusive class and to have Mm. that as the title of the class. Mm. So if people don't know you, they right away know that they will be welcome and accepted and any of that stuff that might come up as an issue in mm. a not so inclusive environment won't be a problem in your class they can just come straight in and just focus on the yoga yeah um one experience i had teaching at an all women's gym uh there were actually some complaints from members about a trans woman who was joined the gym and was a regular in one of my classes and the mm. owner of the gym just kind of took me aside and was just like okay look this is the situation that's going on if anything happens in your class, just make sure she feels really welcome. That's our policy. She's yep. totally welcome. And if anyone raises anything, send them to me okay. and we'll talk about it. I was just wondering, in the world of women's gyms, women's workshops, women's retreats, is there a better way to navigate all of that so that people don't feel excluded? Mm. But there's still, I mean, I am think with the women's gym... They're trying to create a space that is like welcoming and nurturing to women and yeah. everyone who identifies as yeah. female. Yeah. So yeah, I just want your thoughts on that one and the best um, ways to navigate situations like that. It sounds like the owner of the gym did a really good job. I'm not sure what the resolution was. Um, she stayed in the class. Oh, great. So I think the like troublemakers just got so, the message and chilled and they, out. And, and they stayed... T- no one left my class. Okay, so. so that sounds really good. It sounds like the yeah the trans woman was felt I don't, well I don't know how she felt but was welcomed and not pushed away. I reckon and she the, probably uh, yeah. experienced some raised eyebrows yeah. and perhaps a little bit of non-verbal. Right. Because uh, uh, so the complaining went directly to the manager. Yeah. And it sounds like the manager then took it upon themselves to educate the. the yeah, I think that's probably what happened. And then they stayed, which. It's quite a positive outcome because hopefully their um, complaints are coming from ignorance and mm. not a deep set hate. Mm. And then they stayed and hopefully just realise that this There's person lessons. was just a human being like they are. And yeah, it's a women's gym yoga. for all women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the people who are setting up these spaces for women, on their advertising they need to be clear that it's all women regardless of identity, regardless of past, regardless of how I don't know, how they are women. Like, if they're women, they're women. And it, yeah. Know. What would be and a really clear, concise way to express that? Um, or it's just up to the person running the workshop? It would be up to them, and it would be like, um, you can put, for women, you could put your asterisk and then explaining it's fully inclusive, including trans women. Yeah, that's a clear way to say that. Yeah, and then if if people have a huge problem with that, they can do their research, 
they can just not go themselves. Like if they don't want to be in an environment that's fully inclusive of all women. So I think just making it clear and... Yeah, this is the space we're setting up. Yeah, this yeah. is the space. So, I mean, it's something that I'd even like to put on my form and on my festi- on my um, workshops website that this is an inclusive space. Mm. All welcome. Yeah. Because that's how I feel. And it would just be such a horrible experience walking into a new class and just not knowing... Mm. the energy what it's going to be like like yoga should just be such a safe welcoming space where everyone should just be free Mm. to be themselves and learn more about who they are so any boundaries as a teacher that I could clear away from that yeah so I think um I think walking into as a a trans and gender diverse person working walking into any new space there's always this level of anxiety like who else is going to be there am I going to be misgendered how welcoming is it really going to be and so one way to one way to get around that is to not you can ask people's pronouns um, and practice using them and if you make a mistake then just correct it move on don't sort of a lot of people get really worried that they're going to offend and so they don't practice and they shy away from it instead of just yeah like just avoid the whole issue rather than going into it yeah so the way I look at it you can't it's just like learning a new language perhaps it's only one word or two two words so if you don't practice it you'll never learn mistakes happen and no need to freak out if you didn't have a form or someone didn't complete the form and you weren't sure of someone's pronoun you can ask them but don't ask them in, in front, front of the, of the whole class. class just in case they don't want to come out mm-hmm. or is a shock they're not expecting you to ask them you can ask them um quietly privately what's your pronoun and just that simple question what's your pronoun doesn't have to be what's your preferred pronoun or what pronoun do you use just what's your pronoun or pronoun some people might say it's either she or they so they'll go by both so that's one way of making it if you are not if you're a teacher who isn't trans or gender diverse yourself but you still want to create this environment things like that checking your language the gendered language um Toilets can be gender neutral. You don't need to have the icons or the <laughs> words on the toilets. Things like that, which... And it's quite simple. So I think a lot of space is... When the, if it's not run by a trans or gender diverse person, keeping your, um, the ways to make it inclusive quite simple. Because you can't pretend that you're living an experience you're not. No. But you can do these simple things. And... Like, because I have to go to yoga, I go to yoga classes and they're not specifically queer or trans inclusive and heaps of trans and queer people go to yoga that aren't my classes. Uh, So they're definitely out there and they definitely can be out there. And if you go to five yoga classes a week, I only know of yours as the one queer and trans inclusive (laughs) class in Melbourne. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's just... And And ultimately that's the goal. Not to segregate people into like, well, you have to go to this special class, but just to like spread yeah. information so that people are aware in the ways that they can make their classes more inclusive and yeah. more welcoming and not just for queer and trans people for mm. a whole different yeah. diverse range yeah. of people yeah like yoga is for everyone and it's so adaptable as a practice yeah. that as teachers sometimes i guess it's just about communication or empathy or awareness to mm. translate that into making your own classes as welcoming and adaptable for a range of people as possible. Exactly, yeah. And I think it's still in, like it's still quite important to have that space anyway, just because any marginalised group of people, when they're out in the world every day, they're surrounded by the mainstream, so it's nice to have, like, if you look at bars and queer bars, even though most bars, a lot of bars that you could go into feel safe they're not specifically queer but then it's always nice to have a space especially for um that group of people and so that's also why the yoga is good knowing that not only will the teacher be trans gender diverse but a lot of the other people will be as well and all being all together yeah and i mean like say you moved to a new city Mm. and you know we've already spoke about how nice it is to find your yoga class in your new city that would be such a nice community to land in. And I've yeah. noticed that even like on your Facebook page and um, you donate the proceeds of your class to different causes, yeah. community building and activism is also part of what you do with mm. that class and what you teach. Would you yeah. like to speak a little bit more about that? At first, it's always been by donation. 
because I didn't want people to not be able to come based on yeah that's not inclusive being a on another level yeah. yeah and then I thought I'd I'd like to I'd like it to go one step more and and not it to donate to social change organisations and that seems to people like that as well I think people like the idea that they're doing something for themselves but they're also donating to some social change and I think some people they might feel guilty or they're not deserving of self-care they want to be out there saving the world so this is like a little bit of yeah uh, not that we're going to save the world with the donations but oh it's still making a contribution contribution. (laughs) um and it's good um it makes it a collective thing as well that we've all put this managed to raise this money and I usually um, just choose somewhere, but I'm open for suggestions as well, so I've had suggestions before of where it could go, yeah. Um, I know that another aspect of what you do are self-care workshops Mm. for activists, Mm. and it sounds like that you already just touched on sometimes really politically active people actually find it hard to take time out to care for themselves. Would you like to speak a bit about that? Yeah, so that was done a couple this year. Um, One was for an organisation called Plan to Thrive and they can be found on Facebook and they did workshops once a month for the whole year based on self-care for activists and there was all different ones there was shiatsu, I think there was some maybe some art therapy ones there was the yoga, uh, music one and I got really good feedback and I think from the activist point of view they're always on, always think, especially the ones that also do the organising And if that's their full-time job, it's a really big job to organise some of these events and the rallies or the direct actions. And I imagine that they feel responsible for a whole group of people and Mm -hmm. could something go wrong depending on what the action is. So your mind is on overload, your body... um, So, for example, I went and did a direct action the other day and I found out about this particular one... It was a non-violent direct action and it was a secret, uh, secretly organised. So I found about it, out about it on the Wednesday and it was happening on the Friday. So for those two days, even though I wasn't involved in organising, it was on my mind. I was like, shall I do it? Shall I not? Oh, this could happen. That could happen. It might be dangerous. And, you know, I'm feeling a bit nervous. I'm like, well, I'll do it. And then I decided to do it the night before. I didn't have all that much sleep. Then I did it. It was lots of adrenaline during the day. Lots going on mind everywhere and then I'm like oh I need to get to work as well um and then get like, yeah yeah <laughs> then I went to an, another rally that night I had this full day of action and then like afterwards was like exhausted because I need to go drink beer now and then the next day would have normally gone to yoga but didn't and that was just three days mm. of an action that I didn't even organize but I was just yeah like that of. emotional roller coaster yeah. So for people that do this full-time, do the organising or just go to them a lot more than me, they need some self-care. Like I, you know, and as well, I I hadn't really eaten as healthy as I normally would. So I think it's super important. And there's a lot more coming out there of people organising self-care and activist burnout activities, um, such as yoga. And yoga's good because you can take some of the, if it speaks to you and resonates with you, you can take some of the stuff away that you learn in class yeah you can do that breathing to calm yourself yeah. down anywhere at yeah. any time and you can do it like the other day when I was very close to cops on horses and the horses were maybe like half a meter in front of me and it was quite like it was very intimidating but I felt like I had to That's stand my like ground there. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was I tried to incorporate some of the yoga like and but I also learned that next time I really need to breathe more I need to, I think I was standing pretty tall, like in Tadasana and mountain pose, like, it's going to be calm here. We're the ones being non-violent. And it's, that's where yoga can come into that because yoga is a very, it's non-violent in nature. And the cops can be as violent as they want. And so long as we stand in calm and kindness and truth, Mm -hmm. which are those first rules of yoga, then... I think they can work really well together. And I guess having that practice in your body, 
having yeah. many non-stressful sessions where you've had where you've like literally practiced that standing strong yeah. breathing deeply finding your center it's so much easier yeah. to tap into that in a more intense situation where it's already so much a part of your practice and your everyday experience yeah and I'd imagine as well with activists, there's not just the immediate short-term stress and burnout, mm. but there would be the long-term, I've been putting all my time yeah. and energy into this cause and it doesn't seem like things are getting better or even things have gotten yeah. worse mm. since I've started doing this. And that would be really soul-destroying. It would be really hard to stay motivated so and enthusiastic yeah. in the face of that. Yeah. So it's it's positive that there are options for them as well. Because I think they, I imagine that they will have all the enthusiasm and then maybe a crash at the end. It's mm. like when oh. you, you're working and then you take annual leave and you get sick when you stop. Like that. So when people stop, they find maybe they lack momentum. Or yeah, they, like they got off that treadmill. Yeah. yeah. Like what now? Yeah. Hallie Hoops, who we interviewed a few episodes ago, was involved in activism in, in an event that ultimately failed. Yeah, it was a forest that was destroyed oh, for yeah. a coal mine. Yeah, oh, okay. and um, she was quite emotionally devastated. She was there for six months, right? Yeah. Like, living in the forest. I think okay. a lot of people were there for longer and yeah. were really psychologically damaged at yeah. the end of that event, especially since it failed. Oh, that's disappointing. <laughs> mm. So I can imagine how something like this would be really important. Yeah. Mm. And ideally, like, activists would, and some of them will do, but they'd have a regular self-care thing, mm. not just once a month or another one I worked at was called Thrive and similar to Plan to Thrive, but different. And that was a weekend of workshops. It had different streams like trans- transformative justice and body work and grief and bereavement. And and that was great. It had heaps of workshops and lots of activists there, lots of queer and trans people as well. And it was an amazing weekend of workshops and hopefully there'll just be more stuff like that because it's great that they happen but activists who are especially the ones working full-time they need they need like a regular self-care yeah yeah and there would just be that self-care aspect of connecting to people who have a really similar life experience to you yeah not when you're in the middle of trying to organize something else when you are just taking that weekend to just recharge yeah and I know plan to thrive do weekend retreats as well so that's good and, and I think that's well it's like the queer and trans yoga it's good to do yoga with other queer and trans people and the activist retreat, retreats it's good to do some self-care and retreats with like-minded people and yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I imagine some of these people might actually need a little bit of a push to <laughs> into the self care. Yeah, of yeah. Like they won't take a weekend of bliss and relaxation, but if it's like this is for you as an activist yeah. to stay sustainable, mm. that's an easier sell. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that's what it is. It's about being sustainable because if you burn out, you can't go mm. and do these things. Would you like to share, are there any personal self-care practices that are really helpful for you as part of your weekly and daily routine? So apart from my own yoga, like I do some of my own personal yoga practice and I go to some classes as well. And some I used to be really, when I was doing the course, I was very good at like doing my breathing every day, my meditation every day. I'm not so good at that now, but it goes up and down. Like, sometimes you lose it. And I think as humans, we like our routine, but it's very easy to lose Mm it. Um, And other things just generally, like, I cycle around, so that's good, and swimming. And also things like seeing friends doing social stuff. Like making sure you schedule a bit of that into your week as well. Yeah, and doing different activities like... Next week I'll be going to life drawing. And I went to, I couldn't go to any of the Plan to Thrive workshops this year because I was always teaching, but they had one last week on a Thursday so I could go and it was a music in activism workshop. Uh-huh. And it was so good because I use quite a bit of sound in my classes and we were doing, uh, we didn't use instruments, but we were doing kind of chanting and just making keys. And one of the activities was we'd just walk around the room singing a note, any note, and trying to find someone else who was singing the same note and you'd kind of connect together oh, nice. and then walk away. <laughs> um, so that was nice, like, connecting with people based on that. And, yeah, just doing different stuff, like, 
it's nice to have a routine, but it's also nice to just go outside of that and find something new to do that you wouldn't normally do and trying that. It is the flip side of a practice like yoga and meditation and pranayama. Mm. If you did all of those things for yourself every day, that would yeah. be maybe like a two-hour practice yeah. and then you would work and then you would yeah. like eat your healthy food and go to bed early. Yeah. And even though that's probably really healthy for your body and your mind, yeah it still isn't quite balanced. Like, no. I think it's really important to, like, yeah. make time for fun and make yeah. time for friends <laughs> and make time to go outside and do something new and different. Yeah, for sure. And I think it helps me as a yoga teacher as well because otherwise it's just all yoga. Yeah. Yeah, you need to do different things. And mm-hmm. and I think that's why yoga is good because if you're only doing yoga on the mat and in a studio and then you're not taking it out into everyday life, then it's not really yoga. It's meant to be a way of life in a way so even if you haven't been to a yoga class for several weeks for whatever reason but you've been doing other things and you've been incorporating that breathing into just an everyday life situation or incorporating that way of thought and getting to know yourself and self-studies you're you're still doing yoga you just haven't gone and done yeah yeah it doesn't have to be on a mat to do yoga Yeah, yeah definitely and I often if I read articles or hear people I see the yoga in what they're saying even if they're not intentionally doing it or and it, a lot of it comes down to you, the kindness as well and and people every intention and what they do is with kindness and that's the yeah that's the heart of it yeah yeah do you also lead some classes for older adults yeah. yeah yeah do you find that you end up structuring the class in a different way or kind of bringing in some extra props or is your approach pretty much inclusive enough that that's no, it's definitely a different class there's actually less props because I teach in a retirement village so oh, they just don't have any <laughs> they don't have any and I don't have a car and I don't have props so the only props that we have are the chairs um the language I use is the same um and that comes naturally to me like what I was saying earlier about using a lot of gendered language that just isn't me. And I know that some yoga teachers do like to talk about masculine, feminine stuff. I don't. So it's not like I need to... Yeah, you haven't consciously left that out. Yeah. You just wouldn't have put that in anyway. Yeah. Um, so the other things for them, yeah, I mean, they have... Some of them are like 85 and, and deaf. So it's definitely different to my other class. So you find yourself demonstrating more? So oh, yeah, I have can... to do everything. Like, if I scratch my head, they scratch their head. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's two different classes. And, and one, they do have a bit more physical ability. And so they're on the mat. And then the next class, um, they're all on chairs. Um, so I definitely adapt to them. And that's where the inclusivity comes in. It's like some people, they can't raise their, hand, their arms above the head because of shoulder stuff but they still want something to do, so I just tell them to bring hands to the heart. And instead of raising up and down over the head, they just raise hands to heart up and down. And especially with that population, you don't want to limit people more than you have to mm. because the less they do, the less they'll be able to do in the future. So yeah. you do really want to set up a safe space where people can do as much as they can and hopefully yeah. over time maybe even get back a little bit of that strength and flexibility yeah. with the practice. Definitely. And that, coming back to forms as well, I didn't... I didn't never got them to fill out a form because there'd be just so much covered with um, any injuries or issues that they have. And I'm not a medical professional, so I wouldn't know what to do with all this information. So generally, so I show, I made a choice not to make a form for them. Whereas when we were taught seniors yoga, they had these like three pages of forms asking to fill out everything from glaucoma to blood pressure to hip stuff to heart stuff to everything and so I'm just very much like I keep it very gentle mm-hmm. I, I every so often I'll ask them if something made them dizzy mm-hmm. uh, but they're all pretty good at knowing what to do and what not to do they know their own bodies like anyone more than I do so I just sort of lead them and again give them lots of options and tell them n- not to do it like, I know basic stuff, like if you've had your hip replaced, don't cross over. And and the surgeons often tell them what they can and can't do. And often they will get a very clear message from their body. Exactly, and, and hopefully they're just listening to that. Like, I took them through the um, the eight limbs of yoga and the yamas and niyamas, and it was very much like, you need to be kind to yourself, you need to look after yourself, stay true to what you can actually do, and don't try to do too much. So we went through all of that at the beginning, and... 
And it's helpful as well if you have the same group of people every week. So yeah. you can, uh, even if you've not got the information on the form, you get that yeah. information from being with them every week yeah. and that kind of shapes yeah. what, what you know is going to work well yeah. and what is going to need a few different options for different people. Yeah, and with that age and that population, it's a lot more of breathing. A lot of my classes are very breath-focused, but we'll stop and do more breathing techniques and a, a longer guided meditation at the end. So it's definitely adapted. And my class for the QTI, the queer and trans inclusive yoga, is still very much... Like, I'm not really a... I don't think I'm a very pushy teacher. Um, but I go to some classes where I feel like, yeah, I get pushed, and I quite like it. But I think to keep it inclusive, I need to be like, yeah, the, the options. If you want to push it, do it, but I'm not really going to insist. <laughs> <laughs> it's not really what I'm about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'll sometimes appreciate going to a class and being pushed, but that's me personally. And I think as well, yeah. it's being knowing your own body well enough that you kind of know where you're like, okay, this is a little bit beyond what I would do myself at home on my own mat, but I still yeah. know I'm fine here. Like, I'm probably sweating a little bit more and maybe shaking a little bit, but, yeah. you know, I'm still really honouring my needs. Yeah. And sometimes that's a really exhilarating part of being in a yoga practice and kind of just maybe doing something that you didn't realise your body was capable of doing or just feeling really strong and powerful in a pose and, you know, feeling that feeling of challenging yourself. And, yeah, I think it's a really valuable part of the practice. But, yeah, at the same time, I'm not a particularly, like, yeah, yeah. you know, let's go, <laughs> yeah. teacher. So I'll give someone an option of stay here and challenge yourself. As soon as your breath is changing, coming out of breath, that's the breath teaching you to come out. And then I'll give those people something to do while they're waiting for the other people who are giving themselves more of a challenge. Some of these older students, they may not have heard so much around eastern philosophy before how yeah. how receptive are they to that or what is their attitude towards it yeah they were when i was talking them through the yamas and the yamas and the eight limbs they were really interested and i brought them i like made a big diagram and went through it and they loved it yeah and i think as well that was i tried not to make it too airy fairy like, i tried to make it keep it quite modern mm. and relevant to today and relevant to where we are geographically in the world as well so not um, super religious more just about personal yeah 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 and making it so they can keep it relevant to their own personal life as well did you use sanskrit i do a bit but not too much yeah yeah i tend to use and if i do i'll always use sanskrit and then the english as well yeah i'm sort of curious on your thoughts about Tantra or, or Neo-Tantra, because a lot of that seems to be highly like the masculine gendered. Like and... Yeah. Energy. yeah. Um, I think if people want to teach in that way, it's like I respect that there's a very highly gendered Tantra stream out there, mm -hmm. and it's making it clear on the information that you... before people... So people know what they're going in for. So if I... If that was clear to me that it was going to be highly gendered... I'd just make the choice probably not to go, or if I really wanted to go, I'd know that this is what it was going to be like, so I'd know how to, what switches to switch in my mind to try and let that go. <laughs> um, there is a book called Urban Tantra, which is by someone called Barbara Corellis, and that's very much Tantra for trans and gender diverse people, um, and that's amazing. And I, I incorporate a little bit of Tantra-esque stuff in my classes, and I just take out the, the gender stuff, so my class at the moment I'm really into um, using a lot of sound like the seed sounds for the chakra, chakras um, and again that goes back to the, the Sanskrit because I'm always like making it clear that this doesn't actually mean anything it's just a sound to connect with your emotional and spiritual parts of the body um, connect with those energy centers so I do do a bit of Tantra, yeah, take out the gendered stuff and someone if that reminds me of someone who asked me if I would do a session with them never met the person who ran it but we spoke on the phone and he said oh we're really looking forward to you bringing your feminine energy to this and I was immediately just thinking but how do you know that I've got feminine energy like you're making this assumption based on my voice and who you think I am that I'm gonna bring feminine energy but a lot of I've heard a lot of yoga teachers who use masculine and feminine they always say it's not about 
gender. So we're not saying masculine is for men and feminine is for women, but regardless, it, it is. It, I feel like it is. Like even people do attribute all feminine aspects and to to women and masculine to men, and even if that it's not meant to be. And also and sometimes I'll use it as a shorthand as like, oh, feminine energy is receptive and passive and masculine yeah. energy is powerful and dominating. It's like, yeah. whoa, that's yeah. a whole lot of assumptions that's like that's pulled me out of my yoga practice. Yeah. And because society and culture has said that all those masculine things are for men and and the feminine things are for women, even though everyone's supposed to have everything and be this whole being. And, and also, I feel like if he'd read me as a man, he wouldn't have said that he wouldn't have said we're looking forward to your feminine energy and I bet he doesn't say we're looking (laughs) to men and we're looking forward to your feminine energy so that made me really uncomfortable and and question a lot well Mm. aren't we all supposed to have a bit of feminine and masculine energy so why aren't you looking forward to my masculine energy as well yeah so I think like yeah tantra and all that gender stuff can be problematic for the trans and gender diverse communities but there's so many good things about tantra and you can access that especially if you just take out all the gendered stuff and you can still use the other stuff like the like you could just say peaceful and receptive exactly you know powerful and strong like that book sounds really interesting and we can put a link for that in the show notes as well yeah yeah Yeah. urban tantra is good and i you know i use a little bit of that in the classes if someone say walks off the street into one of your classes you've Mm. never had them as a student before what is the one thing that you'd like them to take away from your classes, from your teachings? I'd like them to feel that it is a safe space for the queer and trans community and it's not just because we've written that or I've written that on the website and on the paper and they feel that they can be themselves and be comfortable and confident and not, not be there with this slight underlying anxiety that, of what they might get in a mainstream place. I'd like them to be able to relax and feel confident that they can come back like I remember someone coming and she'd never done yoga before and I could see how nervous she was because even though people know it's a queer and trans space people are still nervous to go into those spaces like I'd be nervous to go into a queer and trans space for the first time and so I met someone at the Thrive Symposium, and they were asking um, about yoga for queer and trans. I was like, well, I do one. And they said, oh, really? I think I think they'd seen it, but they hadn't been because... But they said now that they've met me, they were more likely to go into that space. So people are still nervous going into it. Yeah, so... I'd, and I think it takes a quite a lot of... People might want to go. Like, I wanted to do yoga for a long time, and it took me ages, and I think that's the same... People are experiencing that same thing here, like they know it's there and then they're kind of either trying to find someone to go with or just trying to find the energy to go and make sure that the space is actually okay. And I think that what you're saying for you, like people who haven't tried yoga before often already have a little bit of nervousness of like, oh, is everyone else going to know what they're doing? Am I going to look like an idiot because I haven't done this before and I don't know what to do? And even what you're saying about people wanting to bring a friend along... There's a lot of situations in life that people often don't go on their own. Like some yeah. people don't feel comfortable going to a movie on their own or going out to a restaurant on their own for a meal. And yeah. yoga is such an appropriate place to go on your yeah. own. Like that's your time. I just want people to know that whatever body they have, it's a safe space for that body. And, you know, if people are making an assumption based on what you are that you shouldn't have a body that looks like that, then all different bodies, all different genders and identities I just there together doing yoga. And I get, like, I at the beginning especially, I asked for feedback just because no one's an expert on anything. So even though I am I identify as as queer and, and gender diverse and trans, more trans masculine, doesn't mean that I'm an expert on every single trans person. So if there's something that they need, then they're very welcome to come and speak to me. I guess that's another aspect of an inclusive teaching style it's not a hierarchy it's not Mm. you telling them what to do and what you know it's like that's coming back to you as well you want to learn from them too like everyone's just learning and practicing together yeah rather than a really strict teacher student divide 
what time is your class and how can people find you? <laughs> the class is um, 7.45pm till 9pm on a Thursday. So trialling at a new time. So it will be that for the next three weeks and then there will be the And that's a dance break. of life. Dance of life in, in the grounds of St Mark's Church in mm. Fitzroy, Melbourne. And for people who aren't close enough to get to your class on yep. a regular basis... And also for teachers wanting to learn more, um, mm-hmm. have you got any online resources or texts that you can recommend? Um, yes, yeah, so there's definitely, so Barbara Corellis for Urban Tantra. So my Facebook page is QTI Yoga, uh, so you can find that on Facebook and then there's all, I also put an event out every week and often I'll post articles and, and things that I think are relevant or yeah, so even people who aren't local enough to get to your class could still be part of that community through yeah. that group. Yeah, and then there's a great website from the States called Decolonizing Yoga, and that has various aspects. So it's got queer and trans, got body acceptance, race, cultural appropriation, and feminism, all in relation to yoga. So that's, that's great. And then for more information on just trans and gender diversity in general, there's Transgender Victoria for more information. And then Trans 101. And there's loads on the internet if you want to just familiarise yourself with trans and gender diversity. But I think to take away for teachers who just want to create an inclusive space, don't freak out too much. (laughs) Don't (laughs) Don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. Just be aware that there's... Because you don't have to understand it yourself. You just have to respect someone else's identity. And that goes for everything, not just gender. So... So it's about respect, knowing that there's different pronouns, different genders. Um, if you can have gender neutral toilets, do. And then if things happen, like at your gym, going on the side of the marginalised person who's trying to be pushed out, not going on the side of maybe there's three people complaining, and the fact that the manager didn't just think about money and was like, oh, well, there's three of them and one of them, so definitely, like just going to say no trans Yeah, this is the majority decision yeah. here. Yeah, so actually being ethical. and I mean, when I first started queer and trans-inclusive yoga, I actually did get some criticism from someone within the community saying that by me having the QTI yoga, I was basically saying all the other classes weren't inclusive. I was like, I'm not saying that. I'm just giving a space for people to be in where the teacher has the lived experience as well. Just like if there was yoga for people of colour, yeah, you wouldn't expect a white person to be <laughs> teaching that class. So, <laughs> yeah. It's time for picks of the week. My pick of the week is my current favourite YouTube channel, ContraPoints, which is by Natalie Parrott. She describes herself as a um, pessimistic socialist and she's a trans femme genderqueer lady. And there are some fantastic videos super informative. She essentially just destroys outright type speakers and thinkers and I I find it really interesting because she's got a background in academia and a lot of these sort of men's rights activists and you know the the hard right they like to think of themselves as being highly rational but she just destroys most of their arguments with pretty much you know common sense and and, um, describes everything with a very clear manner and I've, I've learned a lot from her. And it's that. really fun to watch. Usually she'll play mm. every part in the video, so like sometimes up to ten different characters and it's very theatrically mm. shot, like it's quite surreal, like it's yeah. a treat for your eyes as well oh. as your brain. Okay. Sounds and really, really funny as well. <laughs> oh. Yeah, very entertaining. I'm definitely going to really check that out. Yeah. yeah. So my pick of the week is super random. Mm. Um, If you are riding your bike around in the summer heat, uh, you can take a sarong, (laughs) fold it in half, so one third one way, other third the other way, and then you have armholes in your sarong, and it stops your arms and shoulders from getting burnt. If you, like, put it in water, then it'll be cold as you're riding around. (laughs) And you can just arrive at your destination and take it off and be cool and fresh and ready to teach your class. Wow, (laughs) that's great. (laughs) As a side note, it's one of uh, Melbourne's rainiest weekends for some time. I did not leave my sunscarf this weekend. No. Pick of the week for me. Mm. I would promote the Refugee Action Collective are uh, doing weekly rallies for the people on Manus that um, have just been stuck living there in mm. as 
prisoners for almost five years and things are just escalating. So for the every Friday at 5.30 at the State Library, there's a rally in solidarity with them. I think next time, is next one, the next one is actually, um, let's check the date, Sunday the 10th. I think it's 2 p.m. We'll put a link so, to that one yeah. as well. So that would just be going out there and even if rallying or direct actions, you can't get there, you Ringing the Prime Minister's office, we could put the number for the Prime Minister's office at the bottom, actually. I almost maybe know it off by heart now. (laughs) But you can ring the Prime Minister's office and you can basically very calmly, it'll take about 30 seconds, all you have to do is say, I just want to register my concern about the humanitarian crisis on Manus. And they will ask for your first name and your state. And then they will say, it's your concern being registered. And they have to pass that on. And you can talk to your local MPs and councillors and write letters and join in with the actions. Um, and then there's also, if you're in a position to money to donate, there's RISE, um, Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, Refugee Action Collective, and also the WACA, which is the Whistleblowers Activists and Citizens Alliance. And they do a lot of non-violent direct action and have lots of fines to pay. So my last yoga went to them and I was actually sitting at at a barricade, had barricaded the Liberal headquarters in Melbourne and there was going to be a car parking fine and I was like, I'll donate my next yoga to them and it almost covered the fine. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's some direct action for you. (laughs) Yeah, that would be my pick of the week. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Now, it seems that Christmas is nearly upon us. We'll be taking a short break for a couple of weeks, so our next episode will come out in early January. I'm pretty excited to bring this one out, as it will be an interview with Lee Blaschke, co-founder and former president of Yoga Australia. It's an incredible interview, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. Now, before I leave you, I'd like to just quickly ask for you to please subscribe or rate the Flow Artist Podcast on iTunes, Podcaster, Stitcher, or wherever you find your podcast. It would really help us get the word out. If you'd like to send us some feedback, you could drop us a note on our website at podcast.flowartist.com or email us at podcast at flowartist.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. Big, big love.